Right. So we highlight in the main points here. So first, what is a transition metal? And in answering that, why is candium and zinc not a transition metal? Not a transition metal. So let's look quickly at scandium. When scandium forms an ion, it is S, it is the three plus, right? And zinc is Zn two plus. Atomic number for scandium is 21. And for zinc, we know it is 30. So the electronic configuration now, first for the atom, it would be 3D1, 4S2. Remember, argon is 18, and you fill the 4S before the 3D, even though it comes in front. 18 and 2, 20, 20 and 1, 21. So for SC3 plus, how many electrons did it, did it lose? Three. All right, that means the two from this and the one from this. So, S3 plus is just argon, all right? You see, in order to be a transition metal, when you form, when the metal forms an ion, it must have unfilled, unfilled D orbitals. Now, when scandium forms the ion, does it have a D orbital? No, sir. Right. So even though we said the transition metal is from 21 to 30, you must be able to tell them why scandium and zinc is not a transition metal. The reason is this. When it forms an ion, it, there are no electrons in the D orbital. It's gone. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. Let's look at Sorry, so only, only when it's an ion, it is not considered a transition metal because it has filled D orbital. Wait, when it so the criteria, when it forms the ion, it must still have D the electrons, but all of the D orbitals cannot be filled. So let's look at zinc and I will see. So zinc is 30, so it will be argon, 3D10, 4S, that's 30, right? If yes, when, when zinc forms Zn2+, plus. What is the electronic configuration for Zn2 plus? AR3D10. AR3D10. How many electrons can hold in the D orbitals in Ten. total? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So argon. One, two, three. Five, this is the 3D orbital, 10 electrons. All right. Let's compare it quickly to Fe plus. All right. Fe2 plus iron is 26. Argon. Quickly, what is the electronic configuration for iron? It's atomic number is 26. 4 is 2. 4 is 2. 3D, how much? 3D6. 3D6, okay. So what would be Fe2 plus now? AR 3D6. All right. So Fe2 plus is AR 3D6. Remember, we take away elections from the 4S. Orbital first. One second.
Can I listen to the first thing I do? Yeah, transition metal. Okay. All right. Where was I? Right. So if you look now, it would be argon. One, two, three, four, five. That's three D, six electrons. Oh, we fill the D orbital. One at a time. It goes singly. Yeah. Hmm? Oh. Right, so iron is a transition metal. Oh, I mean, zinc is not. Remember, a transition metal should be able to form an ion. And when it does, the d orbital, it should have electrons in it, but it should not be. Look at zinc, look at copper. Can you see why zinc is not a transition metal? Fair because yes, it fair. has unfilled orbitals. Zinc? Wait, zinc? Zinc completely full for the three. Exactly. Three. It's completely full. Right. So, your, your transition metal, it must, it must form an ion and has unfilled D orbitals. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. So, when it comes to transition metals, is is just explaining certain things. So, one of the first thing I explain why zinc and scandium is not a transition metal. The reason is when they form the ion, so for scandium, when it forms SC3+, plus, there's no D orbital. And with zinc, when it forms ZN2+, plus, the D orbital is completely filled. And to be a transition metal, when it forms the ion, the D orbital must be, it must have been uh, electrons, but it must be unfilled. So unfilled D orbitals. So we're clear on this? Yes, sir. All right. Sure, I can go back one more time, please. So we have three elements on the board. So we have scandium. We have zinc. And we have iron. Yes, if you have a friend, I want to sh share the link short. All right. Right, so we have three elements on the board. Two of them is not a transition metal. One of them is. So to, to be a transition metal, must be able to form an ion with unfilled D orbital. All right. So when you look at scandium, right, it is AR 3D1 4S2. When it forms SC3 plus, it loses these three electrons. So it is just argon. So scandium SC3 plus. Does it have any D orbital remaining? No, sir. All right. So it is not a transition metal because it must have unfilled D orbital. When you look at zinc, zinc is argon 3D10, 4S2. When it loses the two electrons from the 4S orbital from ZN2+, plus, the D orbital is completely filled. And the criteria is that the D orbital must be unfilled. When you look at ZN2+, plus, the D orbital is completely filled. So that is why zinc is not a transition metal, neither is scandium. Is that clear? Oh, sir, I'm just joining on. So a transition metal must always have a D orbital that is unfilled. Please repeat the last part. Please repeat the last part. Just so you say again. From the ion, the ion that is formed, the D orbital must be unfilled. Zinc is filled, not a transition metal. Candium, it doesn't have any D orbital at all. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh so that after we we'll add or subtract the charge. After, after, after it lose electrons. 
So this candium, it just have SC3 plus, zinc only form ZN2 plus, right? Because they are not transition metals. We look at Fe2 plus, when it becomes Fe2 plus, the D orbital is unfilled. So it, it, it is a transition metal. All right, apart from that, so I'm going to clear the screen. What are some characteristics of transition metals? You should not least three for the exam, in case they ask. Sir, they form compounds with different oxidation states. Right. They have different they have high densities. Yeah, that's it. All right, so characteristics. Repeat. They have high densities. And high boiling points and melting point. All right, so everything, every physical property is high. The high density, high boiling point, and high melting point. You know that they are catalysts. All right, anything else? They have magnetic properties. Yeah, they form compounds with different oxidation states. That is correct. They form complex compounds. Give me a second, sorry. All right, so they form compounds with different just going to put OS for oxidation state. And one important one as well, colored compound. So in the lab, any compound that is colored, just know that a transition metal is present. That is why aluminum, any compound with aluminum, calcium, potassium, notice they tend to be white or gray. All right, so form that and they form colored. If we look at compounds with iron, it tends to be green. A two is blue, or manganet, purple. Right? So transition metals, they are colored compounds. All right, so you must know some properties. You must know how to identify your transition metal. We have a next term now for transition metals. In case they ask what it means, paramagnetic, right? It simply means that element, I can say the transition element is the transition element. So TE, transition element, is placed. In a magnetic field, it lines the magnetic field. All right. So, for a magnetic, it means two things. When you put it in the magnetic field, it aligns with the field. It aligns with the magnetic field. However, it loses its magnetic property afterwards. Right. So you put it in the field, it will align itself. But once you move it, it loses its property. So it's no longer, it no longer have any paramagnetic property. 
if it retains the, the magnetic property, is ferromagnetic. So this same thing applies, but in the in this one, it will retain its magnetic property. Sarah, two R. Retains. It's magnetic property. Example of this, iron, cobalt, and nickel. So just remember, paramagnetic, it just aligns itself with the field. And if, when you remove the field, it loses its magnetic cover. Whereas ferro, it retains it. Ready again? Yes, sir. Right. The next thing we have to be able to do is explain why trans why transition metals form colored compounds. All right, so the D orbitals. There, we assign a term to them, we say they are degenerate. All right, and this simply means that all five orbitals have the same average energy. So degenerate. All right, so that is what the generate means. Now your transition metals and bind to what we call a ligand. So explain that. All right, just know that when the transition metal, so this so this would be your five, one, two, three, four, five. B orbitals, right, of the same energy. What is going to happen now? They can split into higher energy and lower energy. So two up top and three below, right? I'm going to put some electrons down here. Electrons can be up here as well. So what happens when your transition metal binds to a, a ligand? So the ligand will have down here, right? In explaining this, if they ask you on the exam, just know that when it binds to the ligand, the orbitals will split. Some will be of higher energy and some will be of lower energy. Now, what is going to happen? These electrons of lower energy, they can absorb light in the visible spectrum and they move up. So this electron, just focus on this one, right? It can absorb energy from light in the visible region. And it, it can move up into the 
empty orbital, right? Now, the amount of energy it absorbs, it will correspond to a particular color. For example, in the case of copper, what is the color of copper? I mean, copper two. CO2 plus? No. Please repeat. No. Right, blue. Right? So the reason why copper sulfate is blue is because it can absorb light in the visible region. So again, the reason why it can absorb light is because of the splitting of B orbitals. It's a splitting of a B generate B orbitals. All right. So the orbitals split into lower energy and higher energy. Electrons in the lower energy D orbital can absorb light in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum and go up here, right? Whatever wavelength of light that is absorbed, that is the color that the compound will get, right? So they are colored because they can absorb light in the visible region. Are we clear on this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So just know that if you don't remember everything right, they are colored because they can absorb light. That's the first thing. Why can they absorb light? The orbital is split into lower energy orbitals and higher ones. And it is the electron that is absorbing the energy and moving up. Right? That is how it absorbs the light. I'm going to write it on the screen. All right, so we are answering why transition metals can form blood compound.
EMS is electromagnetic spectrum. Even if you don't remember that, just at least remember that it absorbs energy from the visible region. Just say that. So it absorbs energy from the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. But if you don't remember the electromagnetic spectrum, just at least say that it absorbs energy from the visible region of light. It's So you don't have to swap this. You can put it in your own words. Ligands bind to the transition metal that cause the d orbital to split. Once it's split, electrons in the lower energy absorb light from the visible region and move up into the higher energy d orbital. Did I mention the, the moving apart with electron in the lower energy orbital can absorb energy from the visible region? Oh, I need to add on to that. So it absorbs energy. I'm going to put the additional part in red. Right, orbital split, electrons from low move into high, and that is how you see the color. Is anybody writing? All right, I'm going to clear the screen again. Next question we need to answer is why anhydrous compounds lose their color. Example, copper sulfate. So copper sulfate, we actually look at the labels on these transition metals, you will realize that they have been water of crystallization. For example, copper sulfate pentahydrate means that it has in five water. So for example, there is 
this compound is blue. This compound is white. So if you heat copper, if you heat copper sulfate pentahydrate, it loses the water and it becomes white. So why is this compound blue and this one white? Simple. It loses it loses the 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 ligand. Water is the ligand that cause within of the B orbitals. Resulting in light being absorbed. Without water, this process no longer happens. All right. All the orbitals are now degenerate. When the when the ligand is there, they are no they are no longer degenerate to separate energy levels. You remove the ligand, they go back to being of the same energy level. So that is the explanation. They don't have to be with copper sulfate. So if they phrase it the next way. Just know that once you remove the ligand, it loses the color. So repeat what you just said, please, because it went out. It doesn't matter how they phrase the question. Just know that once the ligand is removed, the transition metal will lose that color. It will not be able to absorb light. Because remember, the whole point of it being able to absorb the light is because of the ligand that split the D orbitals. If you take away the ligand, they go back to being the D degenerate. Again? Yes, sir. Right. What is a ligand? Anything with a lone once anything with a lone pair is a ligand. So in the molecule or ion with lone pair is a ligand. So example, water and ammonia, they are ligands.
properly establish uh, job definitions, job descriptions, and uh, alignment. Well, this is the number of coordinate ones. So it's actually coordinate covalence. So the ligand will donate a pair of electrons. So what is EDTA? No, we just use the abbreviation. I don't remember the exact the full name. We just need to say ED. That's what I can't pronounce. You just need to say EDTA if they ask an example. Sir, is that diamino ethane? Yeah. You can also look at the coordination number from the point of view of the amount of ligands that bind to the essential metal ion. If it's two ligands, Ready again? <clears throat> right, so let's continue. Um, so we know what is a ligand, example of those. All right. I'm going to look at what we call ligand exchange. So think of, we all know about redox reactions, right? So for example, you have copper sulfate and you react it with zinc, right? What will be produced? Zinc sulfate plus copper ion. Zinc sulfate plus copper. Now, what was the color here? Blue. All right. So, what will be the color here? White. All right. The same. So, zinc is displacing copper, and the color will change. In a ligand, one ligand is going to displace the next one, and so you will get a 
clergy. Sir, you said the reason why it is colorless is because the ligand was removed or added what you think. It was oh, no, not this one. Remember, zinc is not a transition metal. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So transition zinc, metal are from group. It will be from titanium to copper. So 20 to 30, okay. A question. Uh, Why is why is copper sulfate blue and zinc sulfate colorless? Because when zinc turn our iron is so copper sulfate is a colored compound. Zinc sulfate does not form. It, it has no color. Quickly explain the difference. Why this sir. has color and this one don't. And sir, oops. Sorry, sir. Um, is it because of the explanation that I gave other, earlier that zinc is not a transition metal? All right. They so wouldn't what have the, the properties then as the transition metal, but which yeah. is this property you don't. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you marks. Sir, but that would be a reason. Yeah, would have mentioned about the water is the Ex ligand. Exactly. Yeah, right. And I just that one. Yeah, actually, I can see. Right. So remember. Sir, we can say because zinc sulfate is not degenerate. No. So you would say zinc first. Zinc is not a transition metal, right? So take out the zinc out of it. So why copper? can form colored compounds. Same explanation, you know. What is it? Quickly. Once you hear form colored compounds, what should be your explanation? It is a transition metal. Which means what will happen? Uh, the water as a I can split the um yeah the, the D, D orbitals, orbitals right in light whatever. Yeah, that explanation. You see, them, once them colored compounds, the splitting of the D orbitals, electrons moving from lower energy to higher energy. So once copper sulfate can form a colored compound, the copper, so we're focusing on the copper, not this sulfate. Is the same reason. Once they go colored compounds, that's the explanation. Zinc is colorless because it's not a transition metal. Right? All the D orbitals are of the same energy. All right, so I was just checking to see if you would remember. Sorry, so the water will split the compound into its lower and higher in it, higher. Split the, D orbital, split the D orbital. The D orbital into the lower and higher energy mm -hmm. where you will see the, the lower energy is where the electrons the, the electrons in the lower energy D orbital absorb mm -hmm. energy and can move up into the higher one. That is when absorption of light occurs. And you can see the color. So say that's like the whole election thing. We can just say it split the D um, orbital starting. Don't say it. Like Don't say it. What is it? <laughs> no, man. As in, don't write it on the water, exam. Like water. Right. Okay, yeah. I can say ligand. Right. Yeah, continue. So we can say the ligand split the D orbitals. Hmm? Causing light absorption. Right. Can you yeah. that? Not, may I say the whole electron moving up to. Yeah, the, man. If you want the full marks, but if you don't remember everything, just put what you remember. So, at, so sorry, the, the electrons move from a lower. Lower energy D orbital to a higher one. Okay. Yeah. So, so D orbital split. 
the orbital lit electrons move up. If the orbital is right, you must can remember that some has to be higher and some has to be lower. So the orbital split high and low. Electrons from yes, the sir, I just never know right. like the word the word electrons. Oh, so okay. Right. So they split the orbital split high and low, and then the electrons move from the lower go up. Right. I saw it absorb the light. The light where it okay. absorb, make it can move from the high to the low. Sorry, from low to high. Full stop. Yeah, so from low orbit from the lower level to the higher level. Right. High. So it absorb the light and can move from low to high. All right. Clear, clear screen. All right. Begun exchange. All right, so an example. Also, when I see CU2 plus, this don't exist. As in, remember, just like oh, we don't have H plus in solution. Actually, H zero. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Right, so there's no CU2 plus. Actually, CU, the water. It's actually a complex ion. A complex ion is a transition metal ion with its, with its ligand, right? So you don't have any CU2 plus. So the two plus will actually be outside of the Bracket. So this is the ligand with copper. Right? So this is actually CO2 plus. But to keep it simple, outside of chance, outside of this topic, we just write CO plus. But in reality, this is CO2. Right? All right, so this is copper, the ligand, right? What would be the color of this, by the way? Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you react it with acid, we're not interested in the hydrogen ion, right? That is not a ligand. Chloride ion, once it has a negative charge, that's a pair of electron, right? The negative charge. Well, if you don't know, it's a lone Right. So, what will happen if this is a ligand? So chloride ion is a ligand and water is a ligand. If we're doing ligand exchange, what do you think will happen? So, the, the chloride will take the place of the water. The water. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right. No, this is actually an equilibrium reaction. So on this side, what do you think? Hold on, you hold on was someone yes. asking a question? Was someone asking a question? All right, continue. Yeah, what will I have? Okay. Copper chloride. All right. And so, water. Right. No, with. It would have two negatives. With, with the with water, because it's a small ligand, we can fit six of it around copper. But chloride ion, it's a bigger ligand. So we can only fit four of it. The only reason why you have four is because it, the chloride ion, it's a bigger ligand. So we can't fit. Water is smaller, so you can't fit six. All right. So I'm going to understand the number exchange something here. You know. Come on, just, you just need to, to remember it. A couple, as in which number? As in the, the four and the six, where the six yeah. they come from, where the four they come from. No, just know that if, when it's water, six. More of exam. All right. So Sorry, for what? Sir, you're not going balance. Yeah, man. All right. What else would we have over here? You would have six water. All right. Six H2O. Six H2O. Yeah. 
So if you're out to show this exchange, just know that if you're using water, it's small, so six can hold. And, and if a chloride ion, a four can hold. So what is the degree one difference, somebody? It's specific ones. It's specific ones. It's typically water, chloride, and ammonia. So I don't want it ammonia. Welcome. So then, like how you say, it's um equilibrium, and then we'll give you something like that for the regarding equilibrium. In terms of the card, oh, just a second. So if this one no, will this still be blue? No. No. Okay. So chlorine, because of the chlorine, it will have a green. yellow green color. So what they could ask, what if you add so you have the solution with copper sulfate and you add acid to it, say hydrochloric acid, hence the source of the chloride and right? Shift from blue to yellow green. Oh, they could ask you, all right, so if we put it in that way, right? When a solution of hydrochloric acid is added to a solution with copper, it changes from blue to yellow green. Explain this observation. What would you say? Explain it. So what yeah. I use, like the legal and name thing there. Yeah, so explain it. It's okay. under, um, so you have a, a solution right with copper and we know it is going to be blue when you add hydrochloric acid it changed from blue to yellow green and we're asking you to explain it why it changed from blue to yellow green all right, so you would add, sir, is it actually the add as the leak, the forget the chloride this one? Right. Cool. All right, so when you add the acid to the blue solution of the copper, oh, yeah. yeah, it would have replaced the, the water molecule because it is smaller than the chloride ion. And then you would get copper chloride and water. Right. However, it is a no, I just asked, okay, no, cool. Yeah, because it asks why it changed from blue to yellow. Oh, so sorry, just start about the displacement to occur. Right. So okay. all you need to say it's a ligand exchange reaction. So the chloride ion will displace the water. But mention the word ligand exchange, all right? Because that is what it's is occurring. A, yeah. So let us just say it's a ligand exchange. So the chloride ion displaces yes. the right the water, and that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen if we add excess water to the solution? After you get the after you get the 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 yellow green color, you pour water on it. What will happen? It's gonna get paler. And you do what? You add water to it. Yeah. What will happen? To, to, to what? The oh. copper chloride. Right. Yeah. It will go back to the copper two plus. So. Right, so reversible. So when you right. add water to that, it's gonna go, go the next. Oh, sorry, because it's the reversible reaction. Yes, it's change back to blue. Why? Why it's gonna change back to blue? Ligand exchange. No, a ligand exchange, but as in. All right, so, a, so when you, as I say, it is yeah. a mm -hmm. what kind of reaction? Reversible reaction. Reversible mm -hmm. reaction. And where is yeah, water? So, it depends on the product size. It's so when right. you add water, it's going to do the, it's going to do the backward. Yeah, it's it's to do it. Who's principal? Um, who's principal? Okay. No, my ass. Who's Let's principal? Adding water. Right. So when you increase the pressure, 
concentration of water, it will want to decrease it. So the equilibrium will shift to the left side. So it will right. go over the Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that means the H2O2 are going to increase, the, um, over there to the copper thing right. are going to increase there. So it would have dissociate the CuCl4. Yeah, the opposite would have gone. Right. So if they ask about the forward reaction, you can say it's a ligand exchange, right? So this ligand will displace the water to give this color. But if they ask you what is adding, a particle, so in this case, if you add water to it, then you mention it's a reversible reaction. So the equilibrium will shift back to the left hand side. Mm -hmm. So forward ligand exchange, they are about adding more water, then you mention Le Chatelier's principle. All right. With this one on the next possibility, right? You know that. You know about carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Yeah. Okay. In the presence, so even if you are in a room with oxygen. Wait one minute, they say. All right. So when, if you add excess water, and if you mention um, the chat here, so that's the according to the chat here, whatever, um, excess water is added, so it will go shift to the left. Shift the, shift the equilibrium. If we go to the left. Right. Which means that you are going to get back this complex, which is blue. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if you're in a room, even if you have oxygen in the room and carbon monoxide enters, carbon monoxide is going to bind to hemoglobin instead of oxygen. Reason for that, the heme group, it has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide and it is ligand exchange. So it is still ligand exchange actually taking place. So it is carbon monoxide or oxygen. All right, so hemoglobin, hemoglobin has a higher affinity or carbon monoxide than oxygen. Hence, carbon monoxide will bind instead of oxygen. All right. If oxygen did have a higher affinity, you wouldn't have carbon monoxide as name. All right, so just remember this. Hemoglobin, it has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide than oxygen. So it will actually bind to it instead. So what was the question for this answer? Uh, it can phrase more than one way. So let us say that, how should I phrase it? A person, I'm not sure how they phrase it, but let's say a person, is inside a room with both carbon monoxide and oxygen present. After half an hour, the person dies. Explain the answer. All right. So based on you. So basically, why the person died from died, carbon monoxide? The person would die due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Then I explain why. And the reason is hemoglobin, when it has the option between CO and O2, it will bind to CO instead of O2. So hemoglobin, even if you are breathing in CO2, I mean CO and O2, CO is going to bind more than the O2. That is why the person died of it. All right. So if you see anything about hemoglobin carbon monoxide, right. That sure, don't rub that off it, right? No. All right, this equation, as you can see, it's an equilibrium reaction. Every equilibrium reaction has an equilibrium constant. This one is called the stability constant. Stability 
constant. And so it is could be the product. You don't you don't need to include the H. It would be C U E L four minus divided by. So if they ask you for an expression for the stability constant, products over over reactant. All right. So right. E U H two O six. Right. Two plus. PL minus okay. So we don't get any calculation with this. The most I will ask for the expression. Now, about this stability constant, the higher the stability. So in terms of the thing with the carbon monoxide and the oxygen, so since I mentioned stability constant now, the higher the stability constant, the more the ligand is likely to find, find the metal ion. The question, if carbon monoxide is more likely to bind to the heme group than oxygen, which one has the highest stability constant? Right. So, carbon, the CO. Right, the CO. So I was saying, if CO is more likely to bind to the heme group, than oxygen, which one of them would have the higher stability constant? Oh, um, yeah, the CO. Yeah, CO. Right. So CO has a higher stability constant than oxygen. Right. So for transition metal, you know about the ligand exchange and what to do. Right. Yeah. Um. Start, so over here, so we have stability constant K star equals. So stability constant is um the product over the right. Over the so yeah. Have plus, when are the H two then? I'm just not clear. We not include the water. Oh, we don't include the water. Yeah. So just remember, once you have an equilibrium reaction, you will have an equilibrium constant. All right. For this reaction, it is called the stability constant. It is again product over reactants. The, the last thing I need to show you for, for this is the, the general properties in terms of melting point, boiling point, when we compare them to, to other to other elements. Is anybody writing at this point? No, no sir. All right. Do this. All right. What they can ask you again for trans for transition metal is comparing it with a regular metal like calcium. A transition metal versus a regular metal like calcium. Give me a second.
Just a second. All right, so like for this question. Of calcium and iron. To give you melting point. Melting point density and atomic radius. H nine All right, so clearly you can see that trans the transition metals have higher melting point, higher density, and a smaller atomic radius comparing them to a regular metal. Why is this so? so? In terms of melting point, right? It's the amount of energy. So you are converting it from liquid to gas. So liquid to, sorry, liquid to, sorry, solid to liquid. We want to see how much energy it takes to do that, right? To break up the force of a chapter. Break up the force of attraction, it's two metals, they have metallic bonding. Now, in calcium, the valence electrons in calcium, so calcium is argon, S2, right? So the, the, the valence electron in calcium is S2. Whereas in a transition metals, the transition metals, the d orbital, the d orbital, and the 4s orbital, all right, are d, sorry, electrons, let me phrase it, electrons in the 3d and 4s orbitals are B localized, all right? So compare calcium with just two electrons versus a transition metal with all those electrons in the D orbital. So clearly a transition metal has a lot more D localized electrons. So that is a key, a key reason. Starting here, the transition metal has a lot more the localized electrons than calcium. Hence, the force attraction, force of attraction is much stronger. Where I have transition metal, in this case, you would have to put Fe, but I'm speaking for any transition metal, this would be a reason, all right? So the force of attraction is much stronger in iron than Calcium it requires a lot more energy to break the force of attraction. in iron than calcium, right? So when it comes to the melting point, because the 
transition metal, it has a lot more delocalized electrons. Remember, metallic bonding, you have your positive ions being attracted to the delocalized electrons. So you have a lot more delocalized electrons, so the attraction is stronger. The attraction is stronger, it is going to take a lot more energy to break that attraction. Right? So that is why transition metals have higher melting point. Density now. When it comes to density, over here it was for and oh, about the right here yeah. about that yeah. just put back the in and in iron for density what's the formula for density right so basically in, in in the same amount of volume, right? Iron will have a greater mass than calcium. So basically, you can pack more iron in a specific volume than calcium, which means that the atomic radii will have to be smaller. So the atomic radii will help to will help to explain density. I'm going to do atomic radius, then the density. So we know that you have the nucleus, right? Which contains the protons, which are positive charge. And then you have the valence shell with the electrons. So if there is a great attraction between the valence electrons and the nucleus, the, the radius is going to get shorter. Just think of the attraction, it's, it is pulling in the electrons. Right. So repeat that both if you have a one. So you have the nucleus which contains the protons and they attract the valence electrons. Now just visualize, just imagine a tug of war. So just imagine the nucleus pulling on the valence electrons. So pulling it closer to itself. So the greater the amount of protons attraction for the for the valence electron is greater. It is pulling in the the orbitals so they come the radius between the nucleus and the valence electron will get closer based on the amount of protons right when you look at calcium the atomic radius is larger for two reasons So trans transition metals have a higher nuclear charge than calcium. The shielding in the 3D orbital this is for a general chain. So the, the nuclear charge transition metals have a higher nuclear charge than calcium. 
a shield in is higher in calcium than the transition metal. In this case, we're talking about iron. As a result, attraction in the meeting is already being recorded you will get it after. and so as a result the attraction between All right, so the greater the attraction, the, the, the smaller the radius will become, All right? Just remember that. So you have a greater attraction in transition metals between the nucleus and the atomic radii. What you need to remember is this part about the nuclear charge. That we mention the general trends and then I explain this. Is it Pete? That we mention the trends, can you explain that part here? He used the nuclear charge to explain the trend in atomic radius and the shielding. So the reason why the atomic radius is smaller for iron is because of the attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. And the reason why the attraction is so high is because of the higher nuclear charge. Remember, nuclear charge is the number of protons in the nucleus. Right. Need to quickly move from transition metals. So then take it all right. If the atomic radius is smaller, right? What are we doing? Density. Iron has a higher relative atomic mass and a smaller atomic. radius so basically it is more compact if something is more compact it will have a higher density so it, you are putting a higher mass in a smaller amount of space because iron has a higher relative atomic mass and a smaller atomic radius it is more dense than calcium
Uh, is anybody writing? Yes, sir. One moment. All right, I'm going to clear the screen. One second, sir. All right. Go ahead. All right. So from the 2022 paper, right? Most. All right, so. Um, from copper one compound. Are colorless. But most two compounds are colored. We are to use the electronic configuration given so CU plus one is two, two is two, two B six. 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, pu2 plus, s2, 2s2, 3p6, 3d9. In, in, quickly, what is the reason? So this one. Sir, because the cu2 plus is, is unfilled while the cu plus is filled, hence. Yeah. The CU2 plus is a transition method. So the continue? Yeah. So the ligand are going to cause it to split the D orbital into a lower and a higher energy level. Mm -hmm. And the electron are going to move from the lower energy level of the D orbital and absorb energy to form a visible to form a visible light, which is the color change you ever see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what that's it. What about? What about copper one? Because the no anagama because it is not a transition metal because the B orbital is filled. So that's why we not like no ligand nago the ligand nago split it into no higher or lower energy levels. Right. So hence there's no so it's degenerate. It's about yeah. Yeah, you're correct for the most part, except the part where you said this is not a transition metal. Something it's copper. Oh, it is. Right. It is. Yeah. But, but because of the D, the D the full field. Yes. Yeah. That's it, right? So you would everything I say it would except for the part about transition. So remember, if the D orbital is filled, so treat. I'm just going to draw the D, D, the D orbital. So once it's split, right? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Is there any room up here for one of these elections to go? No. Right. So there's no way for the electrons to go. But with 3D9, two, four, six, eight, nine. There is there is there is room here, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Right. So, as Shaniko said, this is filled, so there will be no movement of electron from low to high. This one is unfilled. So you can have the movement of the electron, which we did at the, the first part of the class. All right, let's quickly move to group seven. So I'm going to stop this recording here and start a new one for group 